Poppy Playtime is a ripoff of FNAF. Do you remember that phrase? I do. I remember when Poppy Playtime Chapter 1 first released, there were many criticisms like this. It's just a FNAF clone, another horror game for kids, more mascot horror. But recently I went down the Poppy Playtime rabbit hole once again. I've done this many times now. I often find one small lead and I follow that lead to wherever it goes. Often it goes nowhere, but sometimes, very rarely, that lead takes me to a place I never expected. So finally, I'm talking about the lemon. No, this isn't a joke. The lemon is a recurring item that has popped up in several chapters now. Some believe this is nothing more than a joke, a fun item the developers added into the game as a reference to something only the devs understand. And while that could be true, investigating this lead took me on such a journey that I refuse to believe it. Following this evidence showed me that Poppy Playtime did take inspiration from other games. Not FNAF, but some of the greatest games of all time. Not only that, but this lead may be the key to solving almost every mystery in this series. So would you kindly grab your snacks, your drinks, and get comfy? Because today I'm going to prove why the Poppy Playtime Lemon is far more important than you thought. Today, I'm going to prove to you that the lemon is a lie. So if you've never heard of the Poppy Playtime Lemon, let me explain. In June of 2023, Chapter 1 of Poppy Playtime received an update. This was mostly an update to the graphics and the lighting, bringing it more in line with the darker theme of later chapters. But towards the end of the chapter, there was one really odd addition. Among the catwalks below the player, we found one single lemon. Now at first there was a debate about what this even was. While it definitely looks like a lemon, others thought it could be part of a toy, maybe even Huggy's hand. But on closer inspection, we could see that it indeed was a zesty citrus fruit. Not only that, but the new Spanish localization also included a death screen in the game files that referenced it. And voice lines were even data mined for it too. So at this point, most people wrote this off as a joke, just a silly little thing the devs added in that had no real meaning. But you know me, even back then I had a hunch that there was more to this. So I began racking my brain. What could such a silly reference possibly mean? But this is where it started to get suspicious. There is actually another game that has a very obscure lemon reference. Probably the most well-known lemon reference in video games comes from one of the greatest video games of all time, Portal 2. Portal 2 is mostly known for two things, puzzles and lore. Remind you of anything yet? You see, it wasn't just about using portals to get around levels and solve problems. Portal was a series that had an incredibly dark story under the surface, and the more you delved, the darker it became. Portal is a story about a company called Aperture Science. Aperture was a titan of industry, built by a man of pure vision, Cave Johnson. Johnson created the company from humble beginnings, from selling shower curtains to the military, to eventually building such a massive corporation that was guided by a singular principle, science. Johnson was a bit of a mad scientist. He had plenty of ideas, many of which were completely useless, but amongst the rubble were golden nuggets, just a few genius ideas that were enough to raise the company above the rest. Ideas such as the portal gun, a device capable of breaking physics as we know them. By the way, does the original design of the portal gun look familiar to you? That's what I thought too, very similar to Poppy Playtime's grab pack. But Aperture faced one big problem, ethics. You see, Johnson wanted to continually push the boundaries of what science could achieve, but the ethics and bureaucracy that governed science, mostly to keep people safe, slowed down this process. To get around that, Johnson built a giant underground facility, the Enrichment Center, where he could conduct any and all experiments he wanted, all the way from the prying eyes of the government and the law. This is where the story takes a dark turn. In order to run his experiments, he needed participants, but he knew that most of his experiments were dangerous to the point of being lethal. Again, to him, he didn't care. To make an omelette, you have to break a few eggs, right? But who in their right mind would participate in such dangerous experiments? That's why Aperture Science began finding test subjects on the surface. They took those that often had nothing to lose. The homeless, psychiatric patients, and wait for it, you guessed it, orphans. You might have already started to see some similarities with Poppy Playtime here. These subjects were lured in with the promise of $60 if they participated in the experiment. But of course, we know that most didn't survive to ever receive the payout. 
With most of the experiments being so deadly, the company had to continually recruit more test subjects. The facility quite literally became a factory of death. But just like in Playtime Co, this reign would not last. Eventually, the company began to struggle financially, even going bankrupt, something Cave Johnson partially blamed on their rival, Black Mesa. Yes, the Black Mesa from Half-Life. So what did Aperture do in response? Desperate to beat Black Mesa in the race to create the working portal device, they began to replace their workers with non-living versions. Androids. Again, eerily similar to the Bigger Bodies initiative. Harley Sawyer cites the advantages of using living toys as workers. Less pay and less lawsuits from accidents. It's almost a one-to-one -one similarity. Aperture also used these androids as replacements for the human staff that they now try to push into doing the experiments. But just like in Poppy Playtime, these androids were often incredibly dangerous. They were created with extreme intelligence, but no safety features. The company even gave instructions on how to deal with any that go rogue. Ironically, staff were instructed to use paradoxes to shut them down. Kind of like how after the Bigger Bodies initiative was started, staff and Playtime Co. started to go missing. Ironic, right? But if this wasn't bad enough, things were about to get much worse for Aperture Science. Cave Johnson, despite his company having no money left, being on the verge of ruin, invested everything in one final gamble. He somehow managed to spend his last remaining money on huge quantities of moon rocks. These would be ground up and used to create conversion gel, a substance that would be conductive for portals. The problem was, they were also incredibly toxic. Johnson was now sick, dying in fact, and knowing this, he tried desperately pushing the company's research into a different direction, this time into the transfer of human consciousness into computers. Hmm, I wonder if that reminds you of anything. But knowing that he would likely be dead before the research was complete, Johnson instructed the staff to convince his assistant, Carolyn, to undergo the transfer process in his stead, telling them to force her if she refused. This is how the main antagonist of Portal was born. Carolyn was forced to undergo this process against her will. Her body was essentially killed and she was forced to live inside this machine body known as GLaDOS forever. But just in case you thought this couldn't get any worse, when GLaDOS was activated, she immediately tried to kill all the research staff. This led to them developing personality cores and eventually a morality core. Seeming like this had worked and GLaDOS was no longer violent, the scientists let her begin her work researching. GLaDOS, however, had been learning all along. She tricked the scientists into giving her neurotoxin, claiming it was part of an experiment with cats and boxes. They agreed, after all, their founding principle was science no matter the cost. GLaDOS immediately locked down the facility, used this neurotoxin to wipe out most of the staff, and forced the remaining survivors to participate in the deadly experiments as they slowly dwindled. So now we can add gas to the multiple coincidences here, right? The Portal games take place much later than this incident, the main character Chell being woken up from stasis after the facility has already had its downfall, only for GLaDOS to find us, force us into participating in the experiments, promising us cake once we complete them all. Already the player knew something was off about the whole process, not only did GLaDOS seem incredibly suspicious, but the facility was falling apart around them. Throughout our time in the Enrichment Center, we find a number of messages scrawled on the wall from presumably the only surviving member of the staff, Douglas Ratman. Ratman was the one that woke us up, hoping that we would beat GLaDOS. Of course, Ratman tells us that the cake is a lie. A now very famous quote, but one that is designed to tell us not only that GLaDOS can't be trusted, as if we needed any more hints to that, but also adding to the mystery of who this survivor was and how they had so much knowledge of what was going on. Now you have the context for the lemon quote. We get a famous speech from Cave Johnson in a voice recording in Portal 2. It was partially the ravings of a mad dying man. When life gives you lemons, don't make lemonade. Make life take the lemons back. Get mad! I don't want your damn lemons! What am I supposed to do with these? Demand to see life's manager. Make life rule the day and thought it could give Cave Johnson lemons. Do you know who I am? I'm the man who's gonna burn your house down with the lemons. I'm gonna get my engineers to invent a combustible lemon that burns your house down. Finding people. He said what we're all thinking. The point is. If we can store music on a compact disc, why can't we store a man's intelligence and personality on one? So I have the engineers figuring that out now. Brain mapping. 
artificial intelligence. We should have been working on it 30 years ago. And I will say this, and I'm going to say it on tape so everybody hears it a hundred times a day. If I die before you people can pour me into a computer, I want Carolyn to run this place. <laughs> now she'll argue. She'll say she can't. She's modest like that, but you make her. <coughs> no, put her in my computer. I don't care. All right, test's over. <coughs> you can head on back to your desk. Goodbye, sir. But it was also a nod to the idea that Johnson viewed himself as a god. He didn't care what rules he broke, he didn't care how many people he killed, as long as he gets what he wants. When life gives you lemons, burn the house down. The deeper meaning here being that absolute power corrupts absolutely. But if you boil these two stories down to their basic essence and put them side by side, you can really see how similar Portal and Poppy Playtime are. In both stories, an intellectual genius creates a company that becomes a titan in its industry due to his exceptional vision. Both men push the boundaries of science, and both create an underground utopia, where they can continue to innovate away from the laws of the world above. These utopias, though, have their own darker sides, with the staff here working in incredibly unsafe environments, leading to many accidental deaths. Eventually, both companies begin to struggle financially, leading to staff being replaced by non-human workers. These non-human staff slowly kill the human ones, leading to further instability. Eventually, an event led by someone who no longer inhabits a human body causes the downfall of the facility and the company, the remaining staff presumed missing or dead. Years later, an ex-staff member comes back to the facility, works their way through, solving puzzles, avoiding deadly dangers, trying to solve the mystery, take down the bad guy, and put things right. Now at this point, you cannot tell me that Portal has not been in at least some part inspirational for Poppy Playtime. It goes even further than that though. The logo for Playtime Co. looks like Portal. The Kissy Missy poster in Chapter 1 is almost identical to one you can find in Portal 2. I even pointed out the double negative. The design of the environments are too similar as well. Both giant underground facilities that are slowly decaying. Dangerous catwalks, puzzles needed to get around. Portal even had an ARG between games, one of the earliest examples of a game I can think of to do so. The community had to come together to solve puzzles that gave them clues before Portal 2 released. And both games feature a reference to lemons that seem to come out of nowhere. But the more you start to compare the two, the crazier this gets. GLaDOS in Portal was created faster because Cave Johnson was sick. He was trying to perfect the transfer of human consciousness into computers. While in Poppy Playtime Chapter 3, I talked about the possibility that this is exactly how the human to doll transfer process started too. Remember, Home Sweet Home contained what looked like hospital beds. Thomas Clark was transferred into Bronn due to his lung cancer. Note the similarities there to Johnson. And even Theodore Gramble potentially being chosen to become Catnap since he was almost killed by electrocution. Perhaps this being a way to make him better. Late Pierre and Poppy Playtime always seem to be on edge. Some have even suggested he might be paranoid. Well, we see this reflected in Playtime Co's security. It was absolutely everywhere. The grab pack hands being a way to make sure no singular person could get around the whole factory. This mirrors the attitude of Cave Johnson in Portal. He was worried about corporate espionage from Black Mesa. And he similarly had staff spy on each other to try and weed out any infiltrators. It makes sense for both of these facilities to be maximum security though, as both were doing highly illegal research below the surface. Both games feature an incredibly intelligent antagonist that used to be human, but is now more mechanical, both of which are only partially human looking. 1006 being only an arm from what we've seen so far, and GLaDOS having no limbs at all. But these similarities could even give us a clue to theories I've been making for a long time now. We know in Portal that GLaDOS pretends to be our friend, we are constantly told that as long as we cooperate, as long as we keep doing the science, we will eventually be freed, and there will even be cake too. But of course, we know that the cake is a lie. We will never be free. GLaDOS would keep us locked in the enrichment center, constantly testing until we die. Well, who does that sound like to you in Poppy Playtime? There is still a huge debate in the Poppy Playtime theory community on whether Poppy can be trusted. Sure, she says she's on our side, but so did GLaDOS. And just like in Portal, someone is trying to warn us about Poppy with scribbles on a wall. Could this once again be hinting that someone did survive in this factory all this time? Ratman managed to survive for years in the enrichment center due to his extreme paranoia, and that facility was just as dangerous as Playtime Co. 
But we could go even further with this. Knowing that GLaDOS used to be Cave Johnson's assistant until they were forced into an artificial body, does that mean that Poppy was similarly forced into her body as well? The first trailer for the game seems to hint at that, but seeing how close Poppy's case was to Elliot's office, and then seeing how close Stella's slide was to Elliot's, this could be just further hints that Stella Graber is indeed Poppy, which would totally explain why she's so hellbent on revenge against 1006. Again, 1006 hates the staff, Poppy seems likely to be ex-staff at this point. So regardless of whether the lemon has a deeper meaning or not, it led me to discovering just how much Poppy Playtime has been influenced by the Portal series. But that isn't the only game that has massive similarities though. Chapter 3 made me once again go down the rabbit hole. The introduction to Playcare, the cable car ride into a giant metal sphere, reminded me and many others of another beloved game series. Bioshock. The story of Bioshock actually fits pretty nicely into the structure we established with Poppy Playtime and Portal. A genius visionary, this time Andrew Ryan, creates yet another company that becomes a titan of engineering, Ryan Industries. Not happy with how the communist Soviet Union took the common man's labour, and not happy with how the capitalist American society took the common man's money and taxes, both to be given to the poor, Ryan decided to once again create a utopia. This time he created an underwater city called Rapture. Just like the other two facilities, this one was used to push the boundaries of science, with great men and women of intellect being recruited to live and work in the depths of the ocean. And just like the other two facilities, this one would eventually fall. Rapture's fall was accelerated by the discovery of Adam, a substance found in mutant sea slugs that had the power to rewrite DNA. This time, the body horror aspect is a little different. Rather than transferring consciousness like in Portal and Poppy, a change, if you will, in Bioshock, the change came from people using Adam to splice their own DNA. This could give them a number of advantages. It could let them become stronger, faster, even shoot fire from their fingertips. But of course, this came with a cost. The process rewrote their DNA by replacing cells with potent stem cells. But once they started splicing, they required to keep splicing, with those new cells being destructive to the normal cells around them. This is why the splices you see around Rapture look so horrific. Those new cells began to mutate and mutilate their bodies, something Rapture's plastic surgeon Dr. Steinman tried to solve. But this degradation didn't just affect their skin. The use of Adam and the plasmids it offered slowly deteriorated their brains too which is why the surviving inhabitants of Rapture we encounter mostly seem to be gibbering wrecks. This is where I think Bioshock and Poppy Playtime are the most similar. Adam was originally seen as a way to perfect humans. It could make everyone better. Suddenly, everyone's problems could be solved with this miracle substance. Notice the similarity between Adam and this mysterious poppy gel that has been hinted to be integral to the scientific process in Poppy Playtime. Of course, Adam, Eve, and Rapture are all biblical references, and this is something that Poppy Playtime is delving into now as well. I even said that the playcare really reminds me of Elliot Ludwig's Garden of Eden. One of the voice recordings in the game tells us that one of the dock workers, possibly one of the very first people to use Adam, cured his broken hand. A miracle, to be sure. But what started as a way to cure eventually became a way to perfect. It was twisted and warped by people with their own agendas. This reminds me so much of the scientific process in Poppy Playtime. I have talked a lot about how I think it started. I think it began as part of Elliot's mission to bring joy to children. Due to the nature of biology, sometimes people get sick. Sometimes they even die. Elliot knew this, and I think his process originally started as a way to save those children who otherwise would have died. This is why he had a child's body in a duffel bag. This is why the company fought so hard to clear his name. He was trying to save the children. A noble cause, I'm sure. Again, this really fits in with Thomas Clark, an employee who underwent the transfer process after being diagnosed with lung cancer, and Theodore Granville, who I am convinced was chosen to become catnap after his accident as a sort of mercy, his human body being so badly damaged from the shock. Again, miracles. But as we know in Playtime Co, eventually this research would be used in much more nefarious ways. Harley Sawyer twisted this process into the Bigger Bodies initiative. No longer were children being saved, they were now being used as cheap labour. But this isn't the only clear similarity between these two games. 
In Bioshock, just like in Portal, we are being led by a mysterious character who guides us forward. This time, it's a man called Atlas. The player character seemed to arrive in Rapture by accident. The plane he was on crashed near the entrance to the underwater city by sheer luck, and he had no choice but to descend into this mad city to survive. Atlas is the one who explains to the player what's going on in Rapture. Just like in Poppy Playtime though, he always seems to only give us the bare minimum information we need to move forward. It's always, there's no time to explain, or I will tell you everything after you do this. At first he claims it's because his wife and child are being held captive by Andrew Ryan. He claims he's trying to save them and escape Rapture. If we help him, he will help us escape too. This is very similar to GLaDOS and also Poppy. But as we progress throughout the game, things start to unravel. This was, in my opinion, one of the greatest narrative threads in gaming history. It turns out that Atlas isn't real. The man with the Irish accent over the radio was none other than Frank Fontaine, Ryan's greatest rival. And massive con man. There was no family to save. Atlas wasn't helping us at all. In fact, Atlas was manipulating us the entire time using us to overthrow Ryan so he could take over Rapture. What was even more mind-blowing is that a simple phrase he had used throughout the game, would you kindly, was actually a trigger word used to gain complete control over us. It turns out that the player had been born in Rapture all along. He was the result of a mad experiment and the son of Andrew Ryan. The player character is named Jack, and he had been experimented on so that he would age more quickly, but also give an extensive psychological conditioning. Not only was the trigger phrase, would you kindly, implanted so that he would follow any order without question, but he was also given code words that could stop his own heart. This psychological conditioning is something that Poppy Playtime references too, something we see they used on Mommy Longlegs, and something I think has been hinted for a long time now. But now this just makes me even more convinced that Poppy cannot be trusted. All three games have a primary narrator, someone that guides the player, instructs them, and makes promises to them along the way. All three are cheery and charismatic, and all three have a mission that we just have to complete. GLaDOS wanted us to save science, Atlas wanted us to save his family, and Poppy wants us to save the orphans. But all along, all three were given huge warnings. The cake is a lie. Who is Atlas? Run from Poppy. All three of them manipulate the player while lying to their face. GLaDOS tells us that we can leave once we finish the tests. A lie. Atlas tells us that once we rescue his family, we can leave. A lie. Poppy tells us once we get the train code, we can leave. A lie. Looking at this pattern, we can clearly see what Poppy is. GLaDOS took over the enrichment center after being transformed into a machine. Atlas tried to take over Rapture after being transformed from Fontaine into Atlas. Something he did, by the way, to trick Andrew Ryan. He subsequently then also became this monster. Following this logic, Poppy's twist reveal is that she's using us to remove the obstacles in her way, just like Atlas did with us, using us to remove the surviving leaders of Rapture. She's only telling us half-truths. She showed us the Hour of Joy VHS, but neglected to explain why this event started. She tells us 1006 is evil and needs to be killed, but doesn't tell us who he is. She very conveniently hasn't told us who she was yet either. We just have to trust her, even after she took our own choice away at the end of chapter 2. No, Poppy fits in this category of unreliable guide perfectly, so sorry if I don't trust you one bit. But she isn't the only character who fits perfectly with this framework though. Elliot Ludwig is the creator of False Utopia, just like Andrew Ryan and Cave Johnson. All three men were geniuses, men of science, innovation and industry. All three men were born around the early to mid 1900s. All three had huge ambitions and a clear vision that went beyond that of their peers. All three created their own underground facility, or underwater in the case of Rapture, so they could get around the rules and laws of the world above. They would all eventually begin to play God, Johnson throwing lives away to push the boundaries of science, eventually trying to store human consciousness in machines, Ryan allowing people to change their very DNA to become perfect, and Elliot developing a process to transfer human consciousness into dull bodies. All of them having strong themes of immortality. Each of these creator characters began with arguably good intentions, but eventually each would have their utopia come crashing down as they spiraled more and more into villain territory, each man becoming more unhinged, 
each facility becoming more dangerous, each company beginning to struggle financially until each one became a place of death, a tomb. But we can still keep going with this theory. All three companies were founded by a man, but each one was propped up by a very important woman. Carolyn in Bioshock was described as being Johnson's assistant, but he also noted that she was the backbone of the company, one of the reasons she was chosen to become his successor, inheriting Aperture after his death. Tenenbaum in Bioshock was the one who discovered Adam and she helped in the research that followed, but after seeing how young girls were being transformed into nothing more than Adam harvesters, she devoted her time to try and cure and care for them. She too technically inherited Rapture after both Ryan and Fontaine were killed. So who in Poppy Playtime could fit this character role? Obviously Stella. It's implied that she was close to Elliot, her slide was next to his, and she cared for the orphans just like Tenenbaum cared for the little sisters. This could mean that, like GLaDOS, her consciousness was transferred into another body. Remember, one of the earliest theories is that Poppy is Stella. This scene from the trailer could even be a hint that it wasn't voluntary, just like Carolyn. If Stella is Poppy, she would still fit perfectly with that framework. Once a staff member who assisted in the science, she eventually was forced to undergo the transfer process and is now manipulating the player to get what she wants. That would leave just one question. Is she still caring like Tenenbaum? or a manipulative evil like GLaDOS. Both Portal and Bioshock showed how people change, in both the physical and metaphorical sense. The Splicers and GLaDOS represent a physical change being altered by science, but Andrew Ryan and Cave Johnson both underwent metaphorical changes. Both started out with good intentions, but a combination of power, money, paranoia, and company struggles slowly turned them into villains. On top of this, all three games feature an element of psychological trauma. Something that Poppy Playtime has yet to fully explore, but I am convinced we will in the future. But I am sure many of you have one question. Bioshock definitely seems similar to Portal and Poppy, but this is supposed to be a lemon theory. Well, what does Bioshock have to do with lemons? Well, there is actually a very obscure Bioshock reference to lemons too. The little sisters you can find throughout the games have a lot of personality. While we're talking about them, by the way, notice how similar their dresses are to Poppy's? Sure, the dresses of the time might be similar, but they too have gone through a transformation process just like Poppy has. They too have psychological trauma, and they too are relatively small and weak in comparison to the monsters around them. The little sisters need big daddies to act as their protectors, something we theorised Huggy might have been doing for Poppy, although that now seems to be more of a stopping us getting to her kind of job, and Kissy seems to be that protector role instead. But getting back to the point, one rare voice line the little sisters might say is, Six times two is lemon. Now, this has been hotly debated, with some people thinking that they hear the word 11, but to my ears, it definitely sounds like a lemon. I think this, just like our lemon, is a cheeky little joke that has a deeper meaning. The little sisters have not only been brainwashed into becoming harvesters for Adam, but they likely never received a proper education down here anyway. I think this was the devs showing that not only did Little Sisters mispronounce words, but even then, they get such a simple calculation wrong. It's another nod to the idea that there is something very wrong with these children at their core, although through no fault of their own. This could even be yet another thing that Poppy Playtime references though. The letter we got in chapter 1 was full of grammatical errors, and Ollie makes several mistakes in his speech too. He says, Especially. Perhaps this is our hint that those children are changed just like the little sisters. Again, the greater meaning here being that their environment has really done more damage to these children than we first thought. A very, very dark theme. So if the lemon is a cheeky nod to some old inspirations for Poppy Playtime, then what could this mean for the future of this series? I think it's safe to say that one of the forces guiding the player cannot be trusted. The series is likely to have a huge reveal like the multiple twists in Bioshock, again, perhaps we are a toy, just the latest experiment in Playtime Co, or maybe as Poppy said in our dream, we really don't know what is real. I am convinced that we are going to get a twist reveal with 10062, but I will save that for another video. There is also the idea of transferred consciousness. In Portal, Carolyn is transferred into GLaDOS, but her mind at one point was even transferred into a potato, almost as silly as a lemon, right? This could be a huge clue that people in Poppy Playtime have been transferred into machines as well as toys, the Make a Friend machine being one example, and Ollie certainly seems to have that potential too. But if you want to go really crazy with this idea, and I am sure you all want me to, there is one more theme that all three games could share. Multiple universes. 
Portal references the possibility of alternate dimensions, the multiverse theory, something that it shares with its sister series, Half-Life. The idea is simple. There are an infinite number of universes, each operating independently from each other. Aperture Science, or rather, our Aperture Science, theorized of their existence, with some alternate Aperture Sciences actually managing to figure out how to cross into other dimensions, usually to make infinite amounts of money. This was also the main plot of Half-Life, with Black Mesa, that game's science company, accidentally opening a rift into another dimension, kicking off the downfall of humanity on Earth. But Bioshock also went down a very similar route with its third game, Bioshock Infinite. In that game, the players are taken to a very different city than Rapture. This time, rather than a dark and grimy underwater city, the player is taken to a bright and cheerful looking city in the clouds. But by the end of the game, we learn that there are multiple universes within Bioshock. Each one might look very different, but they all contain an anchor point. There is always a lighthouse, there is always a man, there is always a city. This tells us that even though the dimensions may have differences, there are things that remain constant. In an amazing twist of irony, each one of these constants is what we've been talking about throughout this entire video. There is always a man. There is always a company. There is always the pursuit of science. There is always a woman key to the story. There is always a downfall. And finally, there is always a girl. While the exact details might change, these constants remain. And looking at just how well Poppy Playtime fits in with this framework, I firmly believe this is far more than a coincidence. Perhaps Playtime Co. is just this universe's Aperture Science. Maybe The Factory is just this universe's Rapture. Stellar is this universe's Tenenbaum. Maybe Poppy is just this universe's Elizabeth. Or GLaDOS, depending on which theory you believe. This could even go on to explain why this world seems just slightly different to our own. Many of these toys in Playtime Co. seem like very similar versions to ours. For example, Mummy Longlegs is very similar to Betty Spaghetti. Huggy is even very similar to Grover from Sesame Street. All of these similarities could easily be explained by alternate universe. But as I said earlier, the lemon in Poppy Playtime is very similar to the cake in Portal. The cake in Portal was a lie. There never was any cake. We were being manipulated by GLaDOS, the promise of escape being dangled in our face. Now, Mob are manipulating us with this lemon. They make silly little jokes. They prod fun at us as we try to solve the mystery lemon. The most ridiculous thing they've added to the game so far. Something that clearly doesn't mean anything important. While most people believe this is nothing more than a joke between the devs, it's actually the singular most important clue we've ever had. It contains information about the inspirations of the series. It gives us clues about the future of the story. By making it a joke, no one thought to investigate it. And that's why the lemon is a lie. This might have been my most unhinged theory yet. It's definitely the craziest one I've ever made. And honestly, this one took me way more work than usual, having to replay through several games to look for clues in this one. So if you have stuck around all the way to this part, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to support the channel, would you kindly leave the video a like? Let me know in the comments that you enjoyed it and subscribe if you want to see more. As always, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.